I think it is a different way of seeing the city. You know, of mm -hmm. course, you can see Notre Dame and the Louvre and mm -hmm. the Eiffel Tower and all of that. But then you can, you know, for the price of a bus ticket or a metro ticket, you can go to these different neighborhoods and, and find where your heroes live. Hello, I'm Derek Cash with the North Little Rock Public Library System and want to welcome you to meet the author. Our guest, guest today is Dr. Jane Boisvert. She is a native of North Little Rock, Arkansas, and an expert on French language and culture. Jane is here today to discuss her book, Paris and Parisians, a cheapo snob explores the city and its famous French residents. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Jane, for being here. It's such a pleasure. Well, thank you so much to you, Derek and Cameron, and for the North Little Rock Library, Lehman Library, I know it well. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you. Okay. Why don't we begin by letting you tell us a little bit about yourself and your relationship with France or relationship to France? Okay. Um, well, I started studying French when I was at Mount St. Mary's Academy in Little Rock and uh, went on to be a French major in college. I went to Webster University in St. Louis. It was Webster College back then, but now Webster University. And um, as a French major, we were required to go abroad. And I went to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And um, then after I graduated from Webster, I went on to get my master's degree at Boston College. And then eventually uh, got my PhD from the University at Albany at, in uh, New York State. And I understand that you taught French literature on an academic level. Yes, I started out as a high school teacher. And mm -hmm. then I, after I got my PhD, I got a job at Russell Sage College in Troy, New York. And I uh, taught there for 11 years. And uh, I taught literature. I taught language. I was the whole French department. So 101 right through the upper courses. And um uh, I taught courses on history and uh, film, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, you have to kind of do that when you're the only person there uh, in uh, the language. So uh, anyway, uh, we, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my story. Okay, all right. I want to start by talking about the title of your book. I think your subtitle is just adorable. It's, it's, a, it's a riot. Paris and Parisians, and the subtitle is The Cheapo Snob Explores the City and Its Famous French Residents. How did you ever come up with that? I think it's just hilarious. It is hilarious and true. Um, we have two sons, and our younger mm -hmm. son, calls us cheapo snobs. He <laughs> says we want the best that life has to offer for a quarter. And even though that's a bit of an exaggeration, it, there is some truth to it. Mm -hmm. And after I finished teaching, when I retired from teaching, my uh, the same son said, Mom, you should write a guidebook to Paris because you love the city so much. And you could call it the cheapo snob guide and you could tell them all of your hints for saving money and seeing the city. And so that led to the first book. Um, before I started it, though, one of my professors at SUNY Albany said, uh, well, if you're going to do that, you should include where famous Americans lived. So that was the first book. I, it was a guide to the city, as well as where all uh, famous Americans lived, like James Baldwin and uh, Fitzgerald, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, and uh, Hemingway, of course, and Stein, and also a lot of artists and, you know, uh, people from different, uh, different facts, uh, different, uh, what I want to say, uh, lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, so that was book one. And then after that was finished, I asked my editors, uh, what should I do for a second book? And they suggested both the second and the third book. They were like, oh. why don't you do a second book guide to Paris, but talk about famous French people. And then in the third book, uh, again, a guide, but talk about famous foreign people. So that that's the trilogy. Mm -hmm. That's the three books I ended up with. Mm -hmm. I like the fact in your book that you give the addresses for where these people lived or where the buildings are. I always remember reading the, the letters of Edith Wharton. And I don't uh -huh. know if it was in that book or if I had to do research, but it was one of the highlights of my trip when I went to Paris in December of 1988 to see the house and it's got 
I think a circle above the door and it says Edith Wharton and I took a picture of it. Of course you couldn't go inside, but I just I was just thinking about the people that will read this book and if they take it with them or if they photocopy it, whatever, and they've got the addresses and they can go and they can just walk and, and just see, oh so and so lived here or so and so worked here or this is where this building is. I'm so glad you did that because the person doesn't have to do the research themselves. Right. And I think it is a different way of seeing the city. You know, of mm -hmm. course, you can see Notre Dame and the Louvre and mm -hmm. the Eiffel Tower and all of that. But then you can, you know, for the price of a bus ticket or a metro ticket, you can go to these different neighborhoods and, and find where your heroes lived. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, uh, another thing I wanted to mention is that I as I was researching the first book, I found a book written by another French professor years ago, and he had just had the names of the people and the addresses, but he didn't tell me who they were. And so it, it lacked interest, I thought. So that's why I came up with the idea of having a short biography of each person that I list in all three books, and then the, uh, the addresses associated with them. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to write the book? And how did you research uh, the contents, uh, how did you decide I'll include these people, but I won't include these, that sort of mm -hmm. thing? Well, it took me about four years to write the first book. It took mm -hmm. a lot longer for that one than the following two books. The following two books took about a year and a half, something mm -hmm. like that. But uh, uh, how did I decide to, who I chose to be in there? Uh, basically, it's name recognition. You uh -huh. know, I thought, this person is very familiar, you know, to most Americans or whatever. And uh, so that's how I how I put them, how I chose them to put in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, was there another part to your question that I'm forgetting? Uh, I, no, that was about it. How, you know, the time and how did you do the research, that sort of thing. Well, how did I did the research. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That um, mostly it was on the internet. Uh, okay. That is a very good way, especially of finding these addresses. But you have to be really careful and clever about doing it because sometimes you just can't find anything and you have to mm -hmm. keep searching and searching. Mm -hmm. But there are also uh, two things online. Sometimes Google Books has biographies of people and those are very, very helpful. Uh, sometimes it's not the whole entire book, but still it's enough to get you started. And then um, another thing is in the past, people wrote letters. And so I would search like Edith Wharton correspondence and find all of these addresses and not just that, but, you know, people that she had met with and mm -hmm. where they had gone and, and different things like that. So uh, it was really fun and kind of like, uh, you know, doing, I don't know, uh, mystery research, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. trying to delve into these things and, and dig up, uh, dig up the uh, answers to my questions. Mm -hmm. I think it's always courteous when you have a guest that you treat them graciously and you don't criticize. I have just one criticism about your book and that's, I wish, and I'm sure it was because of cost to keep mm -hmm. the book inexpensive. I wish you had photography of some of the, these famous people, paintings, that sort of thing. And I'm, and I'm sure that it was just to keep the book, as you say, a cheapo snob, maybe to keep it on the inexpensive side, but I wish that, uh, if you ever get into a second edition and maybe costs go down, that you could have some photography, that sort of thing. Well, I agree with you. And I wanted to, to do that. And so uh, we went in 2013. That's when I did the bulk of my research. Uh, mm -hmm. But then we went back in 2015 and I took a good camera and took all these pictures, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't have um, a publisher yet. Okay. And when I finally got the publisher, and, you know, I sent him the manuscript and he liked it. And then I sent them the pictures and he said that it would be too expensive. So you got it exactly right. You know, uh, color pictures especially are extremely uh, expensive to to put into books like this. But it's true. I mean, most guidebooks have pictures. So mm -hmm. it's too bad. But yeah. uh, it's still yeah. a great book. It's just just a minor thing that. But and I figured that was the reason. So but yes. nonetheless. OK. Uh, let me, there were, I've got a lot, a few, several questions I'd like to ask you about particular people that you brought up. And as I just go through them, you can comment, etc. cetera. Uh, you bring up Coco Chanel, and I'm sure most people know she was the fashion designer. What did you think of her because of the, <laughs> the German aspect is what I'm really alluding to without 
taking your thunder. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would like to say two things about her. Mm -hmm. And one is the thing that I admire about her. I admire the fact that she grew up uh, in an orphanage after her mother died when she was 12 years old. She and her sisters. Um, luckily for her, she learned how to sew at the orphanage. And then she became this fantastic uh, um, seamstress mm -hmm. and then went on to be a couturière, you know, uh, and, and, and like her name is still on the tip of everybody's tongue because her fashion house has continued. On the negative side, what you're referring to is that she lived during World War II and um, she had a lover who was a German officer and recent documents have uh, revealed that she wasn't just a casual uh, friend of a Nazi. She was also an agent willing to go to Spain and deliver messages for them. Uh, and, you know, really a terrible, a terrible thing, you know, for her country and, and everything. Um, the only reason she was saved from prison is because Winston Churchill knew that Coco Chanel had a lot of information that she could spread around about royalty, about oh. British royalty. You can imagine who that yeah. refers to. The and Duke of also, Windsor. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes I yes. mean, he literally and, was a traitor, he and his wife. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. He went to meet Hitler in 1935 yeah. in, uh, in Berlin. Um, but and not only not only royalty, but also high level British military officials. So he was afraid that she would spill the beans on all mm. of that. And so she got out of it. OK, uh, it was that whole thing was very, very unfair. Some people got punished. Some people got scot free, uh, you know, uh, and a lot of people were accused uh, unjustly. Uh, but uh, then a lot of people, you know, were under the radar and okay. just got away with everything. Okay. Now, another person you bring up is, and I forgive me if I mispronounce the name, Eugene Violet Le Duc. I thought he was fascinating. You say that at Notre Dame, he added gargoyles, cameras, and a spire with his own face on the Apostle St. Thomas. First of all, tell us, tell the audience who he is. I've never heard of this person, of one of the few that I hadn't, but, and, and just that, that he used his own face. Okay. Violet Le Duc was um, uneducated in architecture, and but he he had spent a lot of time in his youth drawing and you know observing uh, different architecture and everything. And then he got this job. Uh, first of all, I think it was at Vézelay, which is a cathedral, and he he literally saved the cathedral from falling in from the mm. roof falling in. Uh, then he did a 20, I think it's 25 year renovation of Notre Dame. And this is what you're speaking about. Uh, this idea of putting one's face or whatever on a, a statue, or in this case, the spire that fell into Notre Dame when they had the mm -hmm. fire a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, it, it dates from way back. You know, people, uh, artists, uh, even in the Middle Ages, sometimes put their own faces on uh, different statues like that. Um, he, at one point, had over 20 projects going at the same time. St. Chapelle, um, I know I'm not going to remember all of them, Carcassonne down in the south, many, many projects. And, you know, it wasn't so easy to travel around at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was a very busy man. But he came under fire, especially from the snobby, uh, you know, university types who, who didn't like it, that he didn't have a university degree in architecture. But hey, he got the job done mm -hmm. and very well done, too. Okay. Well, I'm glad you explained that. I mean, I didn't think anything about it. But now that you say that he wasn't the only one that used might have used his own face in a painting right. or a sculpture that kind of puts it in a better perspective for someone who might not know which i didn't so thank you for uh, elaborating on that you're welcome you say that andre Durain was courted by the germans during world war ii and was later ostracized as a collaborator tell us who he was and what he was accused of doing for or with the germans 
He was an artist and uh, like most artists, you know, dabbled in a lot of different things, uh, you know, sculpture as well as painting, etc. cetera. Uh, he was a friend of Matisse, even though Matisse, Henri Matisse was a lot older than Dorin. Uh, he, they were called fauves. They were called fauves, which is a French word for wild beast. And the reason they were called that is because of the wild colors that they used. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very typical of the time, but especially of this uh, small group of men, mm -hmm. uh, the wild beasts uh, from Collioure. They spent time in Collioure in the south of France, as well as in Paris. Um, he, like I said before, uh, sometimes people were accused unjustly, and that might have been the case with Dorin. Okay. Uh, he accepted an invitation, I believe, to come to Germany to look at museums. And according to some people, uh, that was the wrong thing to do because World War II was going on and German Germany was the enemy. But according to other people, he thought that he his presence there would get some French prisoners of war released. So it's one of those situations where we don't know. We don't know the truth. You know, the truth died with the people at that time. But uh, uh, yeah, again, you just many of the stories are are untrue or exaggerated, etc. It sort of reminds me of Maurice Chevalier. I think he, after the war, I don't know if you brought it up in this book. I don't think you did. But that after the war, he had to defend because he was one of a French actors or singers that was transported to Germany and got accused of he was too easygoing with the Germans, that sort of thing, but he denied anything. And so you're I right. I do mention it in the book. Oh, you do? I do oh, okay. mention it, okay. yeah, that charges were brought against him and Edith Piaf as well. So both Chevalier ah, and okay. Piaf were accused of collaborating. The French call him collabo. It's okay. short for collaborateur. collaborateur and I'll get it out eventually. And, uh, they they were both exonerated, okay. both Edith Piaf and Maurice Chevalier. Okay. But again, it was a crazy time and, uh, you know, all kinds of things were going on. All right. You say that Henry, uh, Henri Matisse's woman with a woman with hat caused some viewers to claw at the painting with their fingernails. I looked the painting up on the Internet and I thought, Okay, because I, I, the first thing I thought was there's something obscene about it, but there's nothing obscene, or at least you know, I should be. Do you know why? Why did they want to do that to that painting? I, again, Henri Matisse and Dorin were called fauves. They were called the wild beasts uh -huh. because of their use of color. Mm -hmm. And if you looked up that painting, and maybe the uh, people watching this program will will also look up Woman with a Hat by Matisse. Um, she has on a huge hat which uh -huh. casts shadows on her face and the shadows are painted in green on the face. You know, okay. it's, the colors are all wrong for what the people at the time expected of, uh, okay. of artists. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, they were used to academic paintings which portrayed women as goddesses, you mm -hmm. know, different goddesses from the past, not real life today women. Mm -hmm. And also that the colors were realistic so this realism and traditionalism are thrown out the window with the fauve and people didn't like it. They had a strong reaction, a visceral reaction to it. And that's why they clawed at the painting okay. when they saw it. Okay. Well, good. Because that was just some, I mean, Grant, obviously if I'd done more research, but I just looked at the painting and I thought, well, I'll let, I'll let Jane explain that on the program. So I'm glad you, 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 were, you knew the answer and were able to elaborate on that. Thanks for the question. Uh, now, Georges Clemenceau, he was at Claude Monet's funeral, and when he saw the black cloth on the coffin, you tell us that he uh, replaced it. He said, no black for Monet. I just, I just thought that was so beautiful. I would like for someone at my funeral, <laughs> take off a black coffin, let's just put a colorful one on and just comment on that. I just, I just love that you put that in there and told us that. I like that quote a lot too. And anybody who knows Monet, who knows his paintings, it's all about color and movement and clouds and boats and beauty. Mm -hmm. And um, if you ever visit his house, I don't know if on your trip you got to go to Giverny, <gasps> no. which was Monet's, you have to go. Isn't that uh, where the water lilies is, are? 
Uh, the water lilies are, uh, well, there probably are some in the ponds that okay. he has there, mm -hmm. but water lilies normally refers to the paintings that he did. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But uh, the house itself is is beautiful and bright colors, yellows and blues and everything. And then the yard, the, the gardens rather, are just outstanding. We went with my sisters at... Um, in springtime, like early May, mm -hmm. and all the tulips were blooming, and you've never seen so many different varieties of tulips. So uh, Clemenceau was absolutely right that Monet even admitted that he had an obsession with color. He said a day-long obsession because he thought about it all the time. He thought about colors. And he's the one who designed the gardens that he has at his house, you know, specifically how he wanted it planted, etc. Well, that's just that's just a fascinating story, and it just makes me even feel. Ha I mean, I'm sorry, he died, but I mean, it makes me feel happier, just vicariously being involved with that funeral because he had a colorful. It was just colored because of that. So I'm just so glad you knew that. Um, Great. I think it's fascinating that Henri Cartier Bresson did not like to have his picture taken. Who was he, and was it psychological or or what that he just wouldn't want to have his photo taken i would say it's more personality I, okay uh reading about him i have found that he was a very shy person uh an introverted person he was also a very uh experienced person in a lot of different uh, uh areas a lot of different domains like uh, he started out as a painter. He also worked in film with Jean Renoir, who's also in the book, a filmmaker. Uh, yes, yes. He, uh, you know, and then one time he saw a painting, uh, excuse me, a photograph that inspired him to buy a camera. And so he bought the new Leica cameras, these small, lightweight cameras that even women were using at the time. And he he didn't want to shock people when he was taking their pictures, so he would never use a flash. And he even covered up the chrome on the outside of the camera with black tape so that it wouldn't be obtrusive, you know. So I think he was just a, a, a person who was respectful of the people he was photographing and also, you know, someone who who was just shy and and didn't like his picture taken. OK, you know, I when I read that, I thought. I think I put more into it than you had implied because there are a lot of people who just don't like to have their picture taken. And I thought, oh, there's got to be some deep, dark secret, et cetera. And so I'm glad it was just, he just was shy, just didn't like to have his photograph taken. That's my is, take on yeah. it. That's my take. Uh, you yeah. know, who knows? Maybe there uh -huh. was a deep, dark secret that I'm unaware of. Uh huh. Jane, is there a fourth book coming out? There is not a fourth book coming out. Oh, what a disappointment. Uh, I... <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Derek. Uh, there is an idea for uh -huh. a fourth book. Okay. Uh, and that is to write a guidebook to Paris for children. Um, and of course, when you talk about children, you know, you talk about toddlers and you mm -hmm. talk about 18 year olds. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they themselves don't consider the, themselves children, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, that's a wide span. So you have to really have a whole lot of different activities that would interest uh, a diverse group like that. So um, I haven't started working on it yet. Uh, I am promoting my book, uh, my books uh, this year. I've done like eight presentations at libraries, et cetera. And, uh, and so that's keeping me busy this year, but mm -hmm. maybe next year I'll uh -huh. start book uh -huh. number four. Do you think you'll have something like uh, Euro Disney in that book? Oh, sure. Of oh, course. sure. Of course. Okay. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know why. The first thing that ran through my mind was even though it is in Paris or outside Paris, it's more, it's an American company. I didn't know whether or not you just stay strictly with French Parisian things, but anything that's children oriented. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Anything from the guignol that take place in the parks to the, you know, pony rides that okay. they give or, okay. or, or sailing the little boats on the uh, Luxembourg uh, basin yeah. or uh, yeah. Disneyland, Disney uh, land, Paris, they call yeah. it. Uh, we went there with our children. We, we lived in France for a year when uh -huh. the boys were like 13 and mm -hmm. 12 or something like 13 and 10, I guess. And um yeah, and it was a nice, it, of all the Disneylands, I think it was the most tasteful. Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's a good place to go. If 
I don't know if they still do it, but if you do this thing with for children, you've got to have a punch and Judy. Uh, yes. 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 Uh huh. Because I remember that from the movie Charade with Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant, and she's and they're watching the Punch and Judy, and I just I've always remembered that, and just I, you've just got to put something like that in the book. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that that's lasted all these years, all these uh -huh. decades. You know the the guignol they call uh -huh. it. Yeah. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then you were okay. All right. That okay. is the guignol. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So every once in a while, I throw in a French word. Well, you know? I'm glad you did, but I'm glad that uh, uh, that you did because I because that way I got to bring it up because I didn't know what you said, so I got to speak just a little bit. Okay. All right. Jane, uh, if people want to buy your book, um, or if they want to contact you, uh -huh. uh, what social media or where can they get a copy of your book? How can they buy it? Okay, well, I am on Facebook, Jane Ritchie Boisvert, because I was a Ritchie before I was a Boisvert. Uh, that's on Facebook. Uh, people can contact me that way. My email address is jr. B O I S V E R T. So my initials, J R and then Boisvert at gmail.com. Uh, I have a lot of books, uh, and uh, people could write me uh, on email or on Facebook, and I could send you books. Also, um, Amazon uh, sells my books. Uh, authors know that Amazon always takes a cut. You know, so for so for us, it's better to order it either through my publisher, which I could easily give you the address to write for them uh, to send you books. You, it's sales at openbooks.com, but uh, books is BKS. It's a little bit tricky. So if, you, if people write to me, I could send them that address so that they could okay. be in touch with the publisher. Okay. Do me a favor. I can't hold the book up because it's got the color, the 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 color of the of the book um, is blended by the screen. But if you hold the book up, I want to ask you a question. Okay, you see okay. that woman on the cover? Who is yes. she? Who is she? She is someone that my editor chose from a bank of photographs that they have access to. I think they have to pay. I think okay. they have to pay. Because on um, book one, there was this woman. Uh huh. By the okay. way, these are all proof copies. That's why they have like not for sale written across the cover. Okay. And then this one is book three. Uh, these people, the, you know, they're probably models or something. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sometimes people think that it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite a stretch. Yeah. Okay. So this one is more like me uh, in okay. terms of hair color, et cetera, than, okay. than the other two. Okay. Uh, I, when I saw that, I thought, oh, I would have loved to have been on the cover of this book. I just loved it so much. And oh but of course, gosh. you know, you know, You'd have, you know, it just, it's impossible, but it's just one of those uh, dreams that you have, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. So I thought, I've got to ask you about this. I'm so glad you knew who she was, et cetera. So uh, I hope that for the people that are watching this program, that they buy a copy and that they enjoy it as much as I did. Jane, oh, it has you. been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I just wish you the best on the, the fourth uh, book that you write. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Again, okay. it was just special for me to be in my okay. hometown library, uh -huh. and uh, I appreciate it so much. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. If you are interested in reading the Cheapo Snob series of guidebooks, you can check them out from the library or purchase them wherever books are sold. You can also find more information at Dr. Boisvert's blog, Cheapo Snobs. Dot com, and I'm assuming that's all one word, or at our website, nlrlibrary.org. Join us again next time, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Derek. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.